Good afternoon and welcome to Curious About Our Planet, brought to you by Glasgow Science Centre. As part of our David Elder Lecture Series, which is graciously supported by the University of Strathclyde, we have Dr. Astrid Werkmeister uh, from the University of Strathclyde in the Department of Electronics and Electric Engineering, bringing you a wonderful presentation called Climate Change from Space. Satellites have seen it all. Uh, what you're going to see in this presentation is all about what satellites are, how we can use them to observe the Earth, what kind of things they observe, uh, what kind of instruments they use, how they can measure everything from uh, our atmosphere, the temperature, and even greenhouse gases. Now, it's all very interesting, and it'll probably bring up a lot of questions, uh, like climate questions. If you have any uh, really urgent questions that you would like to ask Dr. Astrid Wertmeister, you can ask her after this presentation. So make sure to pop those questions in our comments section. Now, those questions will be posted to her after this wonderful uh, presentation called Climate Change from Space. Satellites have seen it all, so please enjoy. Hello and welcome to my lecture about climate change from space. Satellites have seen it all. My name is Astrid Werkmeister and I'm a teaching associate within the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering at the University of Strathclyde. While preparing for this particular lecture, I asked myself, how on earth did I end up here? kindergarten age, I already became fascinated with snow and rain and all that stuff that was falling down on us. And I wanted to understand how these things move around us. So once I was old enough, I got a bachelor's degree in maths and physics and then a master's in atmospheric and climate science. And it was during my master's thesis that I got hooked on studying the atmosphere and also climate from space. I got interested in satellites um, because you can observe all weather systems at once, even in those areas that are really hard to access, like Siberia, the Sahara, or the middle of the ocean. But that information is actually so essential to us as scientists so that we can get a full picture of what's going on above our heads. Before we start, let me just give you two definitions so that you know what I mean when speaking about satellites and remote sensing. A satellite in general is a mass which is circulating a mostly bigger mass. So when it comes to natural satellites, you can say that our moon is a natural satellite to the Earth. The satellites, the satellites that I'm actually referring to in this lecture are artificial, basically man-made. It is technology that people intentionally put into orbit around Earth. The next definition is remote sensing. Remote sensing is a measurement technique of detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation at a distance. What does this actually mean? Well, imagine you're standing in a pitch black room. You really cannot see anything. You reach out your hands and start walking slowly. Your hands touch a wall. So they are feeling, sensing that there is a wall. Now we turn on the light and this light reaches the wall and bounces back and reaches your eyes. Your eyes are seeing, which is also sensing, this wall. And because your eyes are not in contact with that wall, they are remotely sensing this wall. 
And that is the basic principle of remote sensing. Just when we're using satellites, we are looking from very, very far away and we are using highly sophisticated cameras to do so. Now, satellites have been orbiting the Earth for over 60 years now and have been observing us, our doings, and more appropriate, our climate ever since. But what is actually climate and why should we care about it? To answer this first um, part of the question, to be fair, climate can be kind of vague um, and when used in media, it's a very vague description. I can tell you that climate is basically a generalization of how the weather is at a specific place. Let me explain this with an example. People say that the weather in Scotland is usually cold and rainy. What they actually mean is that the climate is relatively cold and wet in Scotland. This, ki um, this is kind of true, but we do have our days of sunshine and warmth. Nevertheless, speaking from a climate science point of view, this is a correct statement. Because when you look at the temperature measurements in Glasgow, for example, for the past 140 years, the average air temperature, that means the most common air temperature in each year is between 5.7 degrees Celsius, which was the coldest year in, on record in 1892, and 8.4 degrees Celsius, which is so far the hottest year on record in 2015. Now, each value on this dark blue line here is a representation of 52 air temperatures that have been averaged each week. That means that, for example, the dot representing 2010 contains actually 52 values, where each value here represents seven values for each day of the week. And on each day, of um, the temperature has been measured at least every three hours. That means that with about eight measurements per day and seven days a week, we can say that each dot here represents 56 measurements. This brings us back to our first graphic, where we can now say that each dot of the dark blue curve represents a year worth of measurements. So 2,912 measurements. If you look now at the entire graph, you get information that is worth 407,680 measurements. So, climate is the average of many, 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 many measurements of the atmospheric properties taken over at least the past 30 years. Now that we know what climate is, why do we need to care about it and protect it? You might have heard on TV or at school that we currently have a climate emergency. The truth is that what we are currently observing in our climate is a change that we have never seen before and especially not at such a fast speed. Climate paleologists, who are kind of the historians of climate, have found that the air temperatures have changed in the past 20,000 years but never have they increased so drastically in such a short time frame than in the past 50 years. We actually need our climate to stay the way that it currently is because these are the conditions on Earth that made human life possible. And since we know that humans are responsible for the current climate change, we know that we can also change it back or at least prevent the worst from happening to us. So one thing that we can do first of all is to observe our atmosphere. And what's the best way to observe the atmosphere everywhere on Earth? With satellites, of course. So depending on um, your satellite, you get different instruments on them to observe the Earth. These instruments can be passive or active. 
This means that they either need some kind of radiation coming from the Earth to capture an image, or they use their own source of radiation. This difference can also be explained with the example of a camera. So when you are only using your camera without the flash, your camera is sensing the light that is reflected by an object, or in our case of satellites, they are sensing the sunlight that is reflected from the Earth and its atmosphere. The same case is true when you are using one of these contactless thermometer guns. They are passive sensors that measure the heat of the skin, which is emitted radiation of the body. By pointing such a contactless thermometer at somebody's forehead, we can find out if that person has a fever. This is the same principle for the infrared sensors on board of satellites. They measure the Earth's and the atmosphere's temperature. So temperature is some kind of radiation, which is infrared radiation, and everything that we can see with our eyes is visual radiation. So let's have a look at some satellite images from the Earth and compare what we can see in the visual spectrum and the infrared spectrum. So here we have now an example on the left-hand side what our Earth looks like in the visual spectrum. During the day, we can see plenty of things, but once the sun sets, we kind of have a problem. Without sunlight, the Earth does not give us any information anymore on the visual spectrum. Thank God that we also have our infrared sensors on board because they are continuing to detect infrared information because the Earth and its atmosphere continue re-emitting infrared radiation even after sunset. This is why we still get information that you see here on the right hand side. Both visual and infrared radiation are part of the electromagnetic energy spectrum. This is basically all the different kinds of radiation that the sun creates or emits. These different radiations are sorted according to their wavelength frequency and also energy. The graphic you see here describes the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We have already seen the visible and infrared spectrum. And another way to classify these radiations is by their wavelength. For now, picture radiation as an ocean wave. If the distance between two waves is smaller than the length of the ship, the ship barely feels that there are waves. But once they reach a certain wavelength, so that the distance between the top of the waves increases, the ship passengers of the ship will probably get seasick. And this is the same principle with radiation. Depending on the wavelength of your radiation, you get an interaction with things that are about the same size as your wavelength. So when it comes to our atmosphere, which is mostly composed out of water droplets, particles and molecules, we can use infrared radiation since its wavelength is approximately the same size as all the things we can find in our air. On a side note, a general rule is that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and also the higher the energy, and in conclusion, the more dangerous the radiation is for our body. What I'd like to show you now are some measurements from the AQUA satellite mission. AQUA is an American satellite and operated by NASA, which is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This mission was mainly designed to collect information on Earth's water cycle, including evaporation from the oceans, water vapor in the atmosphere, clouds, precipitation, soil moisture, sea ice, land ice, and snow cover on the land and ice but it also measures radiative energy fluxes, aerosols, vegetation cover on the land, phytoplankton and dissolved organic matter in the, um, in the ocean, as well
August 2021, so last month. The temperatures are shown in degrees Celsius. It is nicely shown how the seasonal temperatures change between cold in the blue colors and warm, which are the red colors. In the northern areas of Africa, you can even get these purple colors, which means that the temperatures there are sometimes above the scale that we have here, so above 46 degrees Celsius. This is kind of unbearable for humans. Another variable that we can get from the same satellite mission is carbon dioxide. As you probably know, carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases that is responsible for the warm temperatures on Earth. Starting with the industrialization, humans put extra carbon dioxide into the air, which does have an effect on our natural greenhouse effect. With satellites, we can now observe where most of the carbon dioxide is and how it is transported over the globe. In this animation, you can see now the monthly average carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere in parts per million volume. As a reference, before the industrialization, the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere was on average 280 parts per million volume. And as you can see here, the scale starts at 390 ppmv, which is already 110 ppmv higher than 150 years ago. The animation here shows now monthly average values starting January 2014 until February 2017. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any data that was more recent, but what you can see here already is a continuous rise in carbon dioxide concentration over these two years. When it comes to climate change, we are not only talking about the average weather data from satellites or any other ground measurement, we are also talking about extreme events or um, long-term events. So you can use satellite data, for example, to monitor deforestation or rural development, but you can also use satellite data for disaster management. For example, after an earthquake, storms, or um, flooding from tsunamis. And what I want to show you after a few examples is how you can access this data yourself. So the first example I want to show you is the deforestation. So the loss of forest in the years 2001 to 2018 in Brazil. And what you see in this video is the extent of um, forest loss over these years. And you see that a large area of actually um, of Southern America has an increase of forest loss over, um, over, over these years. Another application that I would like to show you is this example of an area in Louisiana in the USA before Hurricane Ida hit in 2021. And what you see here is a little port as well as some houses um, in the canal. And after the hurricane hit, most of the area was uh, flooded. And the port that we, we've seen in the before image is basically gone and the houses um, are flooded. So a way that satellite images are used is to identify whether roads and bridges and other constructions are still intact so that they can be used by emergency services on the ground to access the areas where the help is needed the most and whether to decide to use aerial services like helicopters or planes whether they can land there and see what would be the safest way to access um, an area where help is needed. Here are now some links that will help you to access satellite data directly. The first two links are toolboxes, which help you to visualize the satellite data. 
So the EO browser by the Sentinel Hub is a very nice tool which kind of works like the, like Google Maps and the NASA Earth Data Visualization tool in, works a little bit like Photoshop. So you can visualize and analyze your satellite data as you want to. So this is it from me today. I'm still available now in the Q&A. So please don't hesitate to ask me any questions related to climate change and satellite data. You can also follow me on Twitter. My handle is Satellite Astrid or send me an email to astrid.berkmeister at strath.ac.uk. Thank you so much for listening. What a fantastic presentation. I really thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, seeing how satellites, all of those little bits of information can be pulled out to make a big picture. It's really interesting, but it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Astrid Wertmeister. Astrid, thank you so much for joining us here at Curious About Our Planet. I really thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, it is really interesting to see how we can use all of those satellites to monitor the entire Earth and how we can zoom in to particular places and monitor um, climate change in real time. That's so interesting. It is indeed very interesting. And what is also very interesting is that we've been collecting data for such a long time and um, that we can look back on what's happened before and now with with like um technology getting better and better and getting smaller and smaller we can actually also get higher resolution higher temporal resolution so we can get videos from space that is like fantastic from for for like scientists like me so there's still a lot to come there's a lot to get excited about it does it gets me excited as well when i was watching your video i do get really excited about that kind of information but hopefully everyone watching at home uh was able to get as excited about it as you and i and give us lots and lots of questions so we have some questions for you i can um ask you them the very first question oh this is one where do the satellites look at on earth the most so um, when it comes to science, um, like the first satellites that, that were up there were for military purposes. So they were looking at like target points, basically from like Russia in, and the US. Um, nowadays, when it comes to science, they look everywhere because we want to see as much as possible. But when it comes to the industry, they are mostly interested in like locations where people live. So you get more information actually in um, around cities, um, agriculture, um, and yeah, everything of which you can make money. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I know myself, when we first talked about Google Earth, the very first thing that I looked at was my own house. So yeah. I think that everyone does the same thing as I, well. I did so. too. I did too. <laughs> uh, so let's see what the next question is. Oh, that was the same question. <laughs> um, how long do the satellites last in space? So that is um, a tricky question. Um, some Some satellites satellite missions are planned to to last like a long time um like a few years and then once they are up in space they suddenly crash like a computer or something and once they are up there we can't reach them anymore so that's a little bit of money lost but there are satellite missions that have been up there for already like 10 20 years and are still working and are still delivering very valuable data. So on average, 10 years. 
to 15. That's a, that's a pretty long time. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't really think about how how much turbulence they have to face, all of that equipment going into space. And then once it goes in there, we can't really send IT up after it. We can't go up and switch it on and back off again, can we? That would be nice. <laughs> like getting a hotline. Exactly. <laughs> I've tried turning it off. <laughs> uh, what's our next question? What exactly do you measure in space to monitor climate change? Well, um, there are several things that you can measure. So what I've shown um, in this um, talk is radiation. And that is the like the first thing that you measure at all. And it's um, depending on the wavelength that at which you are measuring. So in our case here, it was in the visual and infrared, but you can also measure in the microwave um, wavelength, um, which gives you more information on the ground itself, like the roughness or like how waves propagate. Um, and you, it is from that radiation that you measure, that you derive the actual, um, prop, um, how you say, the properties of the atmosphere or um, the ocean or whatever you're interested in. So it's an indirect measurement in that sense. Yeah, so you have to measure all a lot of very intricate things to be able to, to measure that climate change, a lot of intricate things, and then put all of that information together. It takes a very long time, I suppose. Um, what is the next question that we have? Oh, this is from Nicoletta. Super interesting. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, I was wondering how this data is being used currently. Have there been any actions taken based around this data? That's a very good question. So um, a lot of satellite data is actually flowing into climate models. So when when you're using climate models, you need to initialize, like set your... your um, your initial conditions before you can kind of project into the future. Um, And a lot of what we've seen in the past basically is flowing into those models to, um, to see where the trend is going and to get like a global image or um, like a global um, information is to use satellite data and um, that's where it's been very very useful and um, now that we get get supercomputers and um, all these high performing machines satellite data is used more and more um, for for these kind of um, prognostics and forecast um, so that yeah the the models are getting better and better because of the new information that is coming down like every day. That's super exciting. Being able to take all of those very small pieces of information, put it into these supercomputers to make, um, and every day they must be getting more and more accurate to be able to predict where our climate is going to take us next. Um, they yeah. could, that could be incredibly useful um, to predict where our climate is going. Yes, and it's also... Um, there's been a study in the recent years by um, a variety of um, weather forecast um, services that have shown that ever since satellite data has been used as input for uh, weather forecasts, the accuracy has increased to up to 90%, which you don't actually think that that is possible. Um, when you sometimes get your weather forecast and you're like, oh, it's supposed to be raining. It's not raining. Um, but the accuracy of weather forecasts for the next one to three days is over 90%. And that is thanks to satellite data. Thanks to all of that information. Yes. That's incredible. Um, oh, we have another question. Have you discovered anything unexpected when observing the Earth? Oh, a few things, actually. Um, one thing that I've 
uh, observed was in a visual image. So when you're taking a picture of um, the earth, you have three channels, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. And they are like um, not taking an image at the exact same moment. They're like a few microseconds bet in between. And um, the resolution in some of these images is really high. And what I've seen was a picture of a plane, but it was taken like differently in, in the um, different channels. So I could see like a rainbow image of, of that plane. Um, that, that was really fascinating. And another thing that I've came across were um, like these, these huge drawings of like from ancient uh, um, people and like not crop fields, but um, some drawings in like um, Australia and South America that you could see from, from space. Like that was like suddenly um, like a man, like a drawing of a man um, in the middle of nowhere, which is fascinating. That is really fascinating to be able to see um, all of these ancient civilizations making their mark and sort of waving hello from the past with these it's, massive, huge images that you yes. can see from space. I mean, who else are they for? <laughs> I don't know. That's I'm incredible. Thinking, like, of, <laughs> of future people looking up on, on looking the down. Yeah. It's quite comforting to see um, all of those images. Um, and being able to see them from a completely different perspective. Um, really interesting. But let's see if we have another question, because we do have quite a lot of questions to go through. Oh, the um, from Kate Underwood. George in Leicestershire wants to know, on average, how many satellites are viewing the Earth at the moment? Well, um, the satellites that are up there are not only viewing, so basically looking up on us, so I know that on total right now, there are around 4,000 active satellites. Wow. Um, and m much more inactive. Um, but they are also used for navigation, for TV broadcast, for um, like many other things. So um, just to get your, your GPS location, it takes at least three satellites that are above your head so that you get your current location um, accurately. And um, yeah, so there are most of them are for, for GPS and they're getting smaller and smaller, these satellites. The, the, the smallest satellites are now about this big. They're called oh, CubeSats and they're Cube. being produced in um, Glasgow. They are indeed. They're being produced right here in Glasgow. Scotland is um, a massive producer of satellites. So there's lots of jobs here in Scotland. If anyone watching would uh, be interested in a career in building satellites. I mean, we're putting more and more of them um, into our atmosphere around us. Um, and obviously there's, there's going to end up a bit of a traffic jam up there. Do you think? Um, actually not. <clears throat> um, space is so big. So um, as of now, um, the community is starting to um, kind of like implement laws on um, how to organize basically and policies around um, like space and who gets to send what up and um, these kind of things. Right now, it's it's open to to everybody, um, and we we need to start thinking about all that stuff that we put up there. There is a graveyard orbit, which is kind of like the furthest away um, where we kind of send all the junk, um, which is, I, I don't know for sure, but it's very far away from, from us. Um, maybe a hundred thousand kilometers away from us. Right. So I don't know from the top of my head, but yet this orbit carries all the garbage. And then the smaller satellites, what they are doing with the mission design is that they are so small 
and they keep them in a lower um, Earth orbit, so closer to the to the Earth, and they are built basically for self destruction. So they burn up like after they're done, after um, a year or so, they re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. And since they are so small, they basically leave no trace. All right. Well, that's a good wave to to get rid of it, like a little streak across our nighttime sky. If you spot one, you can still make a wish, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so we'll pop on to our next question. We know that climate change is progressively getting worse. Have you seen anything getting better or any sign of hope? Um, that's a difficult question. Oh, dear. Um, so when we're talking about climate um, and as seen from space, it's always like you have to look at data for like 30 years. And so the changes that we are making now um, can't be seen on a, like a climate scale. But there are some stories um, that I heard about. It's like um, China and India, for example. They've been the countries that have been getting very green over the past year. So they have been planting trees. And that's something you can see from space. So they have been very um, proactive and active um, and have been getting greener, um, like in a... In a very literal sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that is um really, really nice impact. And also, um, there have been studies just about when lockdown started um, around the entire globe, how carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases, how they went down. Um, so that will be very interesting to see how that maybe creates kind of like a little dip in um, our curve. Well, we'll see if, um, if that's if it has an impact. It'll be really interesting to see because I did see a lot of articles and studies saying um, with the impact of lockdowns and with the reduced amount of human activity that it did have a huge impact on the climate around us. Just to see yeah. how that then has a knock-on effect to the rest of the climate will be really interesting so that it is possible. And also Definitely. to see entire countries um, making such a huge impact that you can actually see it from space um making themselves literally greener um does give you a little bit of hope as well so we are capable of it um of making a huge difference it's pretty good stuff that's that's hopeful uh, okay. let's go on to our next question can we look at the impact of climate change in space for ourselves are there any online resources there actually are. So on the last slide, actually, in my um, my video, I shared some some websites. And um, if I get the chance, I would actually like to show you real quickly how you can access satellite data yourself. Awesome. So the um, starting page for most of us is probably Google. And this is how all my research starts. So I, I go on to... Um, and then just search for EO browser. EO stands for um, Earth Observation. And it's <clears throat> it's a tool from the Sentinel Hub. And um, if you get the Sentinel Hub EO browser as your, your first result, probably just click on, um, on it. And it should open a um, wow. map that looks like this. And it's free to use for everybody. The data is, is free. You can log in. The account is free as well, but you don't need to. And it always lands on Rome. Um, you can easily zoom out by scrolling. Um, it, it kind of works like Google Maps. So this is like the base map. And what you see here on the left-hand side is um, a search window where you can search for, for satellite data. But what I would like to show you now are some of um, the highlights. And in this section here, where it just says default, 
you can open that and it gives you these different themes which you can select and it will show you highlights according to these themes. So they have um, monitoring Earth from space, um, atmosphere and change detection. So all these different applications. And an example I would like to show you is from floods and droughts. So you click on that and you click on highlights. And here they give you um, some examples of some previous floods that happened. And one example that I found particularly interesting is um, a flood that happened in 2019 in Bangladesh. And you get these um, two symbols next to um, these two images here. So when you click on the um, downward arrow, you get some information about the event itself. Um, so these are connected, these two images, and the arrows that are pointing right and left are the arrows that, um, or, or is the button that you need to click to add your image to your compare section. So I'm clicking the during the flood image before, add to compare, and the um, Bangladesh before the flood, also add to compare. And now you see here on the top left that the compare um, section has the number two because we added two images. So you click on it and there you have um, these two images in there. And to center your map now on that location, you uh, click on the zoom button basically and it brings your map right to, to that location. So we're now... Um, near Bangladesh um, in um, East, East India, um, south of Tibet. And what you see here is now infrared image, an infrared image. And what is in green is vegetation and in blue is, um, is water. So you have these two rivers that um, are, are coming together here in Bangladesh. And so what you see here is now the, the top image. Um, so before the flood, and when you take this bar now, you click it and drag it to the left. Wow. You get to see um, Bangladesh during the flood. And um, again, in green is vegetation and in blue is water and um, just like um, like taking this back and forth, you can really see which areas have been flooded, um, especially like this area here in the center where you must have had like a valley or like a protective area that got highly flooded. Um, so this was a really um, a grave event. Um, so, yes, yeah, satellite images uh, are at some point the first source that um, help organizations can use to um, organize themselves to um, yeah, just to assess the, the situation. Yeah, exactly. And there are when you go back to discover um, other highlights that you can uh, visualize and you can always click on the, the arrows that um, show down to get more information on the data, yeah. on the event itself, and um, not only on floods and droughts, but all the other examples that you that you might be interested in. Um, so it's, it's a really nice tool just to look at, at data. You could spend days on something like this. I can tell by that note that you have spent days on that browser. Yeah, I have spent days on, on that browser. 
I think I'll be doing the exact same thing after this yeah. session. I think it's the very first thing that I'm going to be doing as soon as I get home. It sounds even all of the categories that you can look into and the choices and the information. Um, it sounds like a wonderful, looks like an incredible resource of information that people at home can access. And just to, to get a brief taste of how much information all of these satellites are gathering together, how they put it together and mm -hmm. use that information and you can get and it's a free. Of that. and it's that's amazing it's, it's free. free like all the well not all the satellite data is free but um the scientific data um created by nasa and so by the americans by the europeans um it's free it's free for everybody um incredible to download to play with to analyze Amazing. I'll, I'll definitely be losing more than one <laughs> afternoon on that website. Um, now, we have gotten um, one more question after this because we have run out of time. So this is our very last question for you, Astrid. Um, what are your hopes for COP26? <gasps> yeah, My hopes question. for COP26 are that we find solutions. Um, that we set more importance on our well-being than on um, on money. It is kind of like you can't buy health, and um, that we learn to support those countries that are mostly affected by climate change, which are usually the poorest countries. And um, they are not, well, they don't have the money, but that we work together and set our priorities straight. That is my hope for COP26. And that um, is definitely a hope that is shared with myself as well, that we do put um, the collective in front of Monitor again. Um, absolutely. Astrid, you have been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank and thank you for everyone curious about our planet. Thanks everyone um, at the Glasgow Science Centre. Thank you everyone watching at home, but Dr. Astrid Wertmeister, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me.